Praise the Lord for this beautiful singing. I'd like to take just a moment to thank Brother T. L. Lowry and you people for a tremendous offering last night. Can you imagine what the offering was? Seventy-eight thousand dollars. And then listen to this, 76,500 was in cash. Thank you so very much. And you helped us with the expense of this very expensive General Assembly. When we were thinking about the Assembly, Brother Thomas and I met with Brother David Horton and discussed the music. Brother Thomas asked Brother Horton to prepare a musical for tonight in honor of our centennial year. But then we decided to change the program and close out this afternoon. And then Brother David decided that the Lord would have him prepare a special musical presentation for this morning. He prayed, he sought the Lord. He met me in my office and he said, Brother Crowley, I have prayed, I have sought the Lord, and many directions came to me. But then he said the words, the anointing, became so heavy upon my heart and my mind, and I couldn't get away from it. And as he shared with me the format of this musical, he wept. Several times he reached the place that he couldn't talk to me. And I believe the Lord has directed Brother Horton in the preparation of this musical presentation, The Anointing. You pray and be much in attention as they come. where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, 
he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus spoke of himself as the Son of Man, and as the Son of Man, Jesus needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Father. His life is the pattern for his disciples of every age and time. When his earthly ministry was nearing its end, he instructed his disciples not to leave Jerusalem until they had received the promise of the Father. Ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Again he said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. A few days later, this band of believers was gathered in the upper room to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. They were in one mind and one spirit, praising and glorifying God.
Jesus came to be baptized. King of kings yet born to die. At Jordan's banks, John cried, Behold the Lamb. Christ the Lord was then baptized. Heaven's gate swung open wide. The Spirit fell. where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears.
Jesus spoke of himself as the Son of Man. And as the Son of Man, Jesus needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit to do the work of the Father. His life is the pattern for his disciples of every age and time. When his earthly ministry was nearing its end, he instructed his disciples not to leave Jerusalem until they had received the promise of the Father. Ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Again he said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. A few days later, this band of believers was gathered in the upper room to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. They were in one mind and one spirit, praising and glorifying God. heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance.
Aren't you glad for the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Would you raise your hand and say, Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord. Hallelujah! Before the day was over, 3,000 had been added to the church. The people continued in the faith, praying in the temple, worshiping in homes, rejoicing in the Lord. The church grew daily. It was said that these were the people that turned the world upside down. Persecution came, and the believers were scattered around the world. But Jesus had declared that the gates of hell could not stand against the church. The church would be triumphant. Everywhere these Christians went, a new church sprang up because the head of the church was resident inside every believer. God had created a new wineskin, the church, and he had filled it to the full with new wine. The Spirit was flowing, and God's work was being accomplished. After a time, revival fires flickered. People became more concerned with church politics than God's power. They became more concerned with structure than salvation. They were more concerned with organization than anointing. The wineskin became hard and inflexible. It was no longer fit to receive the new wine. Down through the centuries, we see this repeated time after time. God would raise up a people who would receive the new wine. A new revival would begin and the Holy Spirit would flow. God raised up men like Irenaeus, Justinian, John Huss, Martin Luther, John Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, and Dwight L. Moody. As the 20th century approached, God in His sovereign plan began an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that would flow and grow until it would become a mighty river, a flood tide that would sweep around the entire world. One hundred years ago, in the remote hills along the Tennessee-North Carolina border, a group of simple and unlearned people joined together to search the Scriptures and to seek God. In 1896, a small group of these believers were gathered for prayer when something happened that they did not understand. As they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost, they began to speak in a language they had never learned. There were a few scattered outpourings of the Holy Spirit in other parts of the country and other parts of the world as well. But in 1906, a revival began at Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California that signaled the universal outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Wherever the Holy Spirit was outpoured, people would come from far and near to see what God was doing in His Spirit. These men and women were not wise in the eyes of the world, but they were wise enough to seek God, to hear His voice, and to simply obey Him. As in the first century church, those who came to see took note that these people had been with Jesus. As the Spirit moved, there were miracles of healing and sinners were gloriously saved. Born in the flames of Pentecost, the church had a glorious birth Then by the winds of persecution It soon spread to all the earth Though Satan brought discouragement
persecution came. Churches and homes were burned, preachers were beaten, members were shot at, and threats of violence became too commonplace. The young church was driven to its knees, but there they tapped into the wellspring of power. Soon, Satan discovered that the church could not be defeated, for the Holy Spirit is the most powerful force in the universe. Satan discovered that he could not defeat the young church head on. He tried to divert the church from its purpose with heresies. But the Holy Spirit is the great teacher and he preserved the faith. Satan tried to destroy the church with division. But the Holy Spirit is the great comforter and he heals division. The church, led and anointed by the Spirit, continued to grow. R.M. Evans, a retired Methodist preacher, felt the call to the Bahamas and in 1910 became the young church's first missionary. Modern hall of faith heroes like Edmund and Pearl Stark, Alejandro Portugal, Herman Louster, and Paul H. Walker took the gospel around the world. Today, the Church of God has grown from a tiny congregation of nine members to a vast army of over one, half, one and one half million. As God continues to move by His Spirit, the Pentecostal charismatic believers have become the fastest growing and most dynamic force in the 20th century. Church with believers numbering more than 50 million worldwide. with a paradox. The Church of Jesus Christ will succeed and it will go on, but denominations and movements rise and fall. Where will we fit into God's plan? We are America's oldest Pentecostal church, but does that guarantee that we will go on? Does that ensure that God will continue to anoint us? Yesterday's anointing will not equip us to do the work of God today. We must have fresh anointing today. The Holy Spirit is sending a new wave of revival. Will we make an important choice? Will we ride the crest of the wave of revival? Or will we be caught in the undertow of past revivals? Will we wallow in history and be bound by tradition? Or will we be willing to go with the flow of the Holy Spirit? Perhaps we need to ask ourselves, what kind of wineskin are we? Have we become hard and inflexible? Are we still able to receive the new wine? Centuries ago, the Lord spoke, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and will heal their land. That's still the pattern for today. You see, Daniel was a righteous man, yet when Israel in exile, he sought 
He prayed for his sins and for the sins of the people. He fasted and sought God. God heard his prayer and Israel was restored to her homeland. Nehemiah was a righteous man. He prayed for his sins and for the sins of the people of God used him to rebuild the Jerusalem. If we do the work of God today, it will not be because of training and education. It will not be because of our wisdom and intellect. It will not be because of our communication skills or our business acumen. If we succeed, it will be because we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We must humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves and pray. toward heaven and with your heart open let us look to God and pray and ask God for a great renewal O oh Lord God receive us in prayer today as you received Daniel of old and he prayed until you touched him you touched him O oh Lord with power to stand power to speak power to understand power to be enlarged in vision and in burden and in ministry so touch us today lord where we have been like ephesus forsaking our first love help us to repent and to do our first works over so that our lampstand will not be removed where we have been like pergamum accepting false teachings which lead to idolatry and immorality help us to repent so that you will not fight against us with the sword of your mouth where we have been like Thyatira, tolerating the jezebel of worldliness and evil which leads to sin and immorality help us to repent and purge ourselves so that we will not be cast into the judgment of suffering and sorrow. 
where we have been like Sardis, oh God, having a reputation of being alive but filled with death. Help us to wake up and come alive and strengthen that which remains so that we may truly live. Where we have been like Laodicea, lukewarm in our experience and worship and service, touch us with holy fire so that we may be enriched and purified. Help us to hear your voice as you stand at the door of the church and knock so that you can come in and bless us and walk in our midst with your holy presence and your glorious and your holy power. Let us be like Smyrna, enduring sufferings and persecutions without fear of Satan, but with a faith in God. Let us be like Philadelphia, walking through the open doors of evangelism, carrying out the great commission to disciple all nations while we keep in clear focus the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear our prayer, O oh God, this day, for it's in the name of Jesus Christ we ask it. Amen. The anointing makes the difference. Would you say amen? amen? We have been called to win. We can succeed and we will succeed. Jesus is our champion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he goes before us as the eternal conqueror. He has already won the victory. He said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. He has given you and me, his church, the keys to his kingdom. We cannot fail if we follow him. Hallelujah. Death rides blackened clouds across the sky. The Son of Man 
lays down to die with every pounding blow to the nail thunder rumbles all through hell who is there to free us from our sins he sets the captives free his grave becomes the door he enters in to face the author of all sin defying death the grave he takes their keys with them every captive free and from this barren room the captives cry arise for our redemption draweth nigh of hell I now resist for the shackles that had torn my wrist now they lay before me upon the ground to sin I am no longer
Hallelujah! He holds the keys. One thing remains. We must see the world as Jesus sees it, a world that is lost and doomed to die. We must love the world as Jesus loved it. He gave himself that the world through him might be saved. The call still comes ringing down through the centuries. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Those who have experienced his anointing can do no less than answer with Isaiah, Here am I, send me. Many people are hopeless and can't find their way out of their darkness into the day. But we who are called to his glorious light we must shine like a beacon of love in the night we will carry the torch we will lift by the flame we will march through the darkness with the light of his name to the glory of god can defeat us there's no need to fear the Lord goes before us to make the way clear so with our hearts on the flame let his fire be spread to give light If you believe it and you want to carry God's torch, even though you don't have a flame to lift, I want, to, want you to lift your hands as if you're lifting a flame and make that pledge. It's a simple little chorus. You can sing it. We will carry the torch. We will lift high his flame. We will carry the torch.
and the words of Isaiah, Arise and shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord hath arisen upon thee. Well, thank God for the light of his life and for the light of the world, which is his church. We give praise and honor to him this day for the glorious, wonderful, upbeat spirit that exists in this service today. Isn't he wonderful? Could you just take this opportunity to praise him? Just lift your hands to him and magnify his name.